The gummy baryons discover the ABCs of radioactivity. Only they've been called alpha, beta, and gamma since 1899. That's when Ernest Rutherford separated uranium radioactive rays into three types, and he named them after the first three letters in the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and gamma. And he named each type according to the distance it traveled through matter, so gamma rays are the hardest to stop. Fortunately, he also found that all radioactive rays could be stopped by a quarter inch of lead. Because without shielding, excessive exposure to radioactive rays could cause cancer, or kill cells, or even cause radiation burns. It's sort of like getting sunburned inside your body. Alpha and beta rays are actually particles. This was not known when Rutherford first discovered and named them. A chart of particle construction is shown on the left. This chart is based on the best predictive model we have today, known simply as the standard model. In this model, the world is made up mostly of three kinds of charged elemental particles, the down quark, the up quark, and the electron. A baryon is a standard model particle that is constructed from any three quarks. The proton and neutron are both baryons. We see that the neutron consists of one up and two down quarks with a net charge of zero. The proton consists of one down and two up quarks with a net charge of plus one. However, the alpha particle consists of six up and six down quarks, so the alpha particle and beta particles are not baryons. Next we see that a beta particle is a single electron exiting a neutron. As shown, a neutron decays into a proton, an electron, and other lesser known particles. This radioactive process is called neutron beta decay. Later on, when we talk about atoms, we'll often refer to an electron that gets ejected from a neutron as a quark electron. This is just a reminder that the location for this electron is in the nucleus, not in the orbital shells of the atom. One of the problems with the standard model is revealed in the figure at lower left. The down quark isn't really a fundamental permanent particle. Sometimes it changes into an up quark and that makes the neutron change into a proton and eject an electron. It's like some money in a bank vault that changes from dollars to marks to francs. It's the same amount of wealth or energy, just in different forms. But only a down quark has the nuclear currency that can be exchanged for an up quark and an electron and other particle currency as necessary. The gummy models are unique in that they have no down quarks. This is basically due to an exchange inside the standard model particle bank vault that was described on the prior slide. This exchange has been made to enable 3D models and to simplify quark counting and to make the atomic nucleus more understandable. The down quark to up quark substitution eliminates the use of the non-fundamental down quark. This allows the gummy models to be drawn with just two particle types. So now a neutron consists of three up quarks and two electrons. And a proton now consists of three up quarks and an electron. Observe that once this exchange is made, a simple 3D structure is formed. It looks like a three-sided pyramid with quarks at the base and an electron at the top. Or the electron could have been drawn underneath the quarks in a mirror location that the gummy models label as a go-to zone. Go-to zones are shown as semi-transparent spheres. In the picture of the gummy proton model, three up quarks are shown in purple and labeled with a U. Up quarks each have a charge of plus two-thirds and thus repel from each other. Three up quarks have a total positive charge of plus two. And even though the up quarks repel each other, that repulsion gets balanced with an attraction to the electron and its charge of minus one. The quark electron is shown in reflective silver and labeled with an E. So the combined 3D structure has a net charge of plus one, and that's what's known as a proton. Of course, the checkerboard floor isn't really there inside the nucleus. It's just included as a visual reference for better 3D perspective. In the gummy models, the neutron is an unstable oscillator and therefore radioactive. To model a neutron, the 3D gummy proton just has a second electron added to it. So what is the net particle charge now? Of course, the answer is zero. The particle is neutrally charged, and that's where the name neutron comes from. But how can the electrons hop or oscillate back and forth from top to bottom when there are no go-to zones? Well, we can let the electrons hop or ripple past each other and reform on opposite top and bottom sides 
as long as they stay in sync with each other. If they get out of sync and both electrons try to reform on the same side, then they will strongly repel each other because they're both negatively charged. It's kind of like a game of musical chairs when two players try to sit on the same chair. One gets ejected. This always eventually happens and then one of the electrons is ejected from the neutron and the neutron turns back into a proton. So the neutron behaves as an unstable oscillator until it decays back into a proton and then it can practically exist forever as a stable oscillator. The ejected electron is what Rutherford identified as a beta ray. Rutherford found that beta rays could be stopped by a quarter inch piece of aluminum. The modern name for this process is neutron beta decay. In the remainder of part one, this new 3D model or gummy model will be used to look at five separate intranuclear structures for hydrogen and helium atoms. One of the five structures shown is radioactive. Can you see the pattern or zone that makes it different? Starting with the hydrogen one atom, the nucleus is just a single proton. Nothing unusual about that. The only change from the gummy proton model shown on the previous slide is that the three up quarks are now shown as a triangle. This is just a more visible way to show where the up quarks are located, namely at the points of the triangle. The gummy model for an atomic nucleus will always be drawn with triangles and spheres. Triangles for quark triads, reflective silver spheres for electrons, and semi-transparent spheres for go-to zones. So what's the answer? What makes the hydrogen-3 nucleus unstable and therefore radioactive? Well, let's look ahead at the 3D gummy models that will be used in part two to see if that gives us any additional help in finding a pattern. Here we see five more 3D gummy models showing additional intranuclear structure. That makes a total of 10 different nuclei used inside various atoms of hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. This time, three of the nuclei are radioactive, while only two are stable or non-radioactive. Do you see the pattern? The pattern that makes some atoms radioactive is that the single semi-transparent sphere, or go-to zone, is missing in the nucleus. So we need to learn what this means, and then we can re-examine each of these nuclei in more detail. And a good place to start is by identifying the forces that cause radioactivity. Four forces, gravity, electrical strong force, electrical weak force, and electrical EM force. And except for gravity, all of these forces are variations of the electrical force and they are all well described by the standard model. So what causes radioactivity, or in particular, alpha and beta rays? What force determines when the nucleus will disintegrate? Well, on Earth it's not gravity and it's not the strong force. Primarily it's the weak force that determines the absence of any shared go-to zones and that's what governs the types of radioactivity that we've studied so far in light nuclei. The gummy model for the hydrogen atom nucleus will be our first test case for go-to zones. We know that the nucleus is a proton and that a proton has one go-to zone. So this atom is stable and therefore not radioactive. Notice that the triangle is the gummy graphic for quark triads. Three quarks taken together are called a triad. We have started to build up the nucleus one quark triad or triangle at a time. The first triangle is just our old friend the proton or the hydrogen atom as it's better known. The superscript mass number in the upper right corner will always equal the number of triangles. The mass number can also be written with a dash after the element name. So hydrogen 1 has one triangle or one quark triad. Hydrogen 2 is hydrogen with two triangles. Hydrogen 1 is the most abundant form of hydrogen. Almost all of the hydrogen on Earth is in this form. The gummy model for the nucleus of the deuterium atom will be our second test case for go-to zones. So let's add a second triangle and form hydrogen 2. The mass number at the end of the element name denotes an isotope. What's an isotope? Well, there is still only one proton, so the hydrogen 2 atom will behave chemically like hydrogen 1, but it is an isotope because of the extra triangle. Just remember that the mass number will always be the same as the number of triangles. 
and from this point on adding a triangle means the same thing as adding a neutron. Hydrogen too is also known as deuterium and it is the basis for heavy water. We write heavy water as D2O instead of H2O because it's based on an isotope. Now if heavy water makes up only a small percent of the world's water, where would one expect to find a fluid that is heavier than normal water? One place to look would be at the bottom of any deep water holding area, like a fjord in Norway. So deuterium is the simplest example of a neutron being stable. It is also the simplest example of two subatomic particles binding together in a stable arrangement. But why is the neutron now stable? Why doesn't it have a half-life of only 12.8 minutes? It's stable because the deuterium proton has a single extra go-to zone that can be shared by the deuterium neutron. The three quark electrons have four locations or chairs where they can reside, sort of like one more chair than the number of players. The neutron will now oscillate forever without undergoing beta decay. And because the neutron is stable, the nucleus and subsequently the atom will also be stable. So if you ever visit the ocean depths, you know that you don't have to worry about heavy water radioactivity. Notice that the go-to zone has four locations to choose from, and it does. It rotates among the four locations like a never-ending game of musical chairs. We know this is so because experiments show that in the nucleus, protons change into neutrons at the same time neutrons are changing into protons. Actually, the gummy models show that the individual protons and neutrons lose their identity. The nucleus is just a mixture of quark triads, quark electrons, and a go-to zone that moves around from location to location like a game of musical chairs. And because there is a gluon exchange during this game of nuclear musical chairs, it is primarily the strong force that holds protons and neutrons together. So even while the go-to zone is being swapped around, a simple 3D structure is maintained. The force that binds the proton and neutron together is still the electrical force, primarily the strong force. But notice that in the gummy model shown, that the two corners of the left quark triangle, or proton, are attracted to and try to line up with the two electrons of the right triangle, or neutron. In this case, there is only one quark pulling on each electron, not the three that are apparently necessary to initiate a gluon exchange. We learned earlier that this limited one-on-one -on -one electrical force between the quarks and electrons of separate subatomic particles is called the weak force. So the electrical weak force contributes a little extra binding energy to help hold the protons and neutrons together. But more importantly, the weak force is what causes the gummy model quark triads or triangles to line up in a structure. And that structure determines the number of go-to zones. And the number of go-to zones determines whether or not a nucleus is radioactive. Therefore, it is the weak force that primarily governs radioactivity. Next, let's add a third triangle or neutron and form hydrogen 3 or tritium as it's known. But how many neutrons can we add to the hydrogen atom? As shown in the chart at right, there are six known isotopes of hydrogen. We have now shown gummy models for the first three. In the tritium nucleus, the two vertical triads are sharing a quark electron location, so the other new electron must now fill in the old go-to zone. The easiest way to keep track of how to draw gummy models is to use the graphic rules shown at the bottom of the slide to generate isotope charts. To determine how many triangles there are for any atom, just take the number of protons and neutrons and add them together. To figure out how many electrons are needed, take two times the number of neutrons in the atom plus one time the number of protons, add them together, and in this case you come up with five electrons that are needed to be shown in the model. The hydrogen isotope chart summarizes these calculations for all six of the known nuclei in terms of neutrons, triangles, and quark electrons. Note that as one works across the chart, new pieces are added to the existing geometric model by attaching a new triangle edge to an old edge at right angles. We've already seen that this is how the weak force lines up the best. So after correctly positioning these additional pieces, the gummy model shows us that this nucleus has no go-to zone. Therefore, this nucleus is unstable and will undergo neutron beta decay. 
an electron will be ejected from the nucleus and the hydrogen atom will become more positive and attract an additional orbital electron and in doing so it will become a helium atom. The half-life for tritium is 12.33 years. Generally the greater the half-life the less radioactivity there is. Notice that the hydrogen isotope chart has been updated with color coding to show which isotopes are stable and which isotopes are radioactive. And now as we go to the next slide, observe what happens to the electron that's highlighted with a yellow circle. In this slide, a moment of time has passed and beta decay has occurred. An electron has been ejected from the nucleus because where there was once an electron bordered by a yellow circle, there is now only a semi-transparent sphere that represents a go-to zone. So an unstable isotope of hydrogen has turned into a stable isotope of helium, but it is a very small percentage of all the helium found on Earth. Once again, it is the existence of one and only one go-to zone that shows us that the gummy model is stable and not radioactive. To double check our drawing, we can look up helium-3 and find that it has two protons and one neutron in the nucleus. Then using the gummy graphic rules, the model should and does contain three triangles and four gummy quark electrons. As you can see in the helium isotope chart at right, there are eight known isotopes of helium and only two are stable. Helium-3 is shown on the left with its three triangles and four electrons. Helium-4 will be shown on the next slide. Next, let's add a fourth triangle or neutron and form helium-4. This nucleus, when stripped of orbital electrons, is also known as an alpha particle. Alpha particles leave the nucleus during alpha decay. Recall that alpha decay is one of Rutherford's three types of radioactivity. He found that just a single sheet of paper could stop alpha rays. The most novel thing about the gummy models is that they introduce the concept of virtual quark triads. When we add the fourth triangle, two new virtual triads are created, one on the top and one on the bottom. So with nine quarks, we had three triads, but with 12 quarks, we get the expected four triads plus two virtual triads. Anyway, where the points of three triangles come together on the top and on the bottom, you get two more triads, but these virtual triangles won't be graphically shown in the gummy models. The number of triangles shown will always match with the superscripted mass number. The gummy models are intended to make counting quark triads easy and as a bonus they also make it easy to identify when virtual quark triads should be present and accounted for. And because helium-4 forms two new virtual quark triads, the protons and neutrons are bound with more strong force and weak force than usual. So this is a very stable combination of baryons that the atom usually breaks down to during nuclear disruptions known as fission. In particular, when a nucleus gets more than 143 triangles in it, the repulsion among all the protons gets so strong, some isotopes fission spontaneously, and one or more alpha particles are ejected. Because helium-4 is so stable, almost all of the Earth's helium is found in this form. And in checking with the gummy graphic rules, we see that we should have a total of four triangles and six electrons. That leaves us with one stabilizing go-to zone. So this is a stable nucleus, and even more so because of the extra binding by the strong force and weak force. This is the particle emitted from the nucleus that makes up alpha rays. Before we say goodbye to the gummy baryon models, let's review a practical use of our beta decay knowledge. In particular, let's learn about carbon-14 dating. About 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen-14. And in the upper atmosphere, continual neutron bombardment from cosmic radiation occasionally results in a neutron colliding with a proton inside the nitrogen nucleus. And sometimes this results in the nitrogen proton claiming one of the two quark electrons from the incoming neutron. For the quark electrons, it's just a game of musical chairs. Any go-to zone will work. As a result, the incoming neutron gets one quark electron removed and leaves as a proton. But the nitrogen-14 atom, with one of its protons being changed into a neutron, now becomes a carbon-14 atom. Note that it still has 14 triangles. 
it's just that a nuclear quark electron got added. The addition of a nuclear electron is known as electron capture and it is usually followed by beta decay sometime later. Sometime later for carbon-14 is thousands of years. The radioactive half-life for carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Carbon-14 is a pure beta emitter. For plants and animals that ingest carbon compounds or gases, carbon-14 is taken in as a small but constant and measurable percentage of carbon-12. After death, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio changes as carbon-14 continues to beta decay and can't be replenished. This ratio gets too small to be measurable after about 40,000 years of decay. The key assumption for the accuracy of this dating method is that the carbon-14 formation rate was and is constant. If not constant, the only other thing that will ensure accuracy is if the carbon-14 formation rate has changed in a manner that is known and can be corrected for. And finally, in the credits section for part one, we see once again that GUMMY stands for Generalized Understandable Models of Intranuclear Instruction. The 3D computer models of the nucleus were made with Magic Camera Ray Trace software. Most of the knowledge and all of the references were garnered from the three authors listed.